I'd like to talk today about product line connectivity strategies. We get a call about once a week from somebody who says, I'm trying to figure out what my connectivity strategy should be for my product line. And it could be anything in automotive, it could be somebody in barcode, it could be somebody in wastewater treatment, whatever it is. And I'd like to talk today about the kinds of things to think about when you're trying to figure out what your product line connectivity should be. My name is John Rinaldi, I'm the owner of Real-Time Automation. And today I just want to give some advice to people who are thinking about the, the product line and the kinds of things that they should be considering when they're talking, thinking of a connectivity strategy. The first thing I would, I, I would say is, well, what, are you gonna, what do you want to talk to? So there's really a control, if you want to talk to the controls, to controller in a control system. So are you part of the control system or not? Sometimes you are, sometimes you aren't, sometimes you, you're part of that and, and the uh, IT data systems, the Industry 4.0 system. But if you're part of the control system, basically you want to talk to a PLC, and that's going to be uh, either probably either a Siemens S7 or it's going to be a Control Logics from Allen Bradley. Uh, those are those are really that covers about 90% of the market when you when you hit that, maybe even 95% of the market if you don't count Asia. So in the, you know S7s talk Profinet and Control Logic talks Ethernet IP. Now, and there's lots of different ways. Now, the thing about Profinet, oops, I spelled Profinet wrong. Profinet. So the, things about, the thing about this is that uh, pro, Ethernet IP is rather small, easy to put in software. So if you have a small microcontroller, you can get that. Profinet's a lot larger, takes a lot of resources uh, to, to implement Profinet. It also takes you need to have a, an operating system like a Windows or a Linux to do Profinet. The interesting thing about Profinet now is there's something called the OCS. The OCS is the Open Controller System, I believe it's called, Open Community Software. Essentially, Siemens put all of its Profinet in the public domain. So now it's going to be a lot easier to get Profinet deployed on lots more machines. We're going to be, it's designed for people like us, real-time automation, to provide that software to, to put a wrapper essentially on the open the OCS software so that it can be deployed in end users' devices. So that's kind of what we're, we're and we're able to, we'll be able to do that this year. Uh, do that. Now, when you're gonna, if you're gonna do this, you have to think about what's your strategy. Is this a hardware or a software? At RTA, we provide we can provide you with a, a PCB to do that. We can provide you with a software to do that. We can provide you with a module to get you connected to these, oh, these industrial networks. And sometimes you have to do Modbus, sometimes not. Now the second, this, you know, so, but if you're, not gonna be, if you're not part of the control system, you're not part of the control loop of a machine, maybe you're just an IoT device and you're providing data. Well, if you're an IoT device, there's two things that are important. One is you have to collect data. So we have, we have various ways of helping you collect data. So you collect data from the control system from devices typically in the control system or ancillary devices. You might have temperature sensors. You might have other kinds of devices that are providing data that are not part of the control loop that you have to get. So how you get those devices is something I'm not really prepared to talk to today because it's, it, that can get it into a lot, that's a pretty huge discussion. So let's not talk about that. But you want to provide the data um, you want to get your data probably using MQTT, OPC UA, or maybe WebSockets or something like that so that, that you can get that data and your some kind of device is going to be in the manufacturing system and be able to generate some kind of edge device. The big thing that you don't want to do, you don't want to be in both. You don't want to be both part of the IT system and the control system at the same time. A lot of people are building these devices with two NICs in them. So that one NIC is, goes to the control system, another NIC goes to the IT system. That's really bad, because this is a security risk. This is if somebody, you know, somebody on the IT system talked, I've always said this, been saying this forever now, the IT system is where the hackers hang out. There's no company that can keep all the, all the hackers out of their IT system. They're there. So all you've done here is allow them to compromise the microcontroller in here, the microprocessor, and boom, now they have access to the control system. 
So this is not the, this is something you definitely don't want to do, but a lot of people are doing this anyway. I don't think it's a great idea. So the third, that's essentially the third thing that we want to talk about is security. So the first, the first rule of security is keep the IT and the OT separate. They, you know, do not mix them in the same com computer so that they can both be, you can go from one to the, you can jump from one to the other. How do you do that? Well, there's a couple of different ways to do that. The ways I like to do that are one-way gateway. A one-way gateway is a, a device like I just talked about before that has those two NICs in it, but they are, they are, they are on different microprocessor. So there's a microprocessor here, microprocessor here, and those things, the, the, the OT can, microprocessor can only send data to the IT microprocessor. So this stuff sends out MQTT, OBCUA, WebSockets, this stuff is on the control system. They're completely separate. If you compromise this guy, it has no way of communicating and compromising the, the, the microprocessor that's in the control net. So that's one way. Another one is a perimeter security device. And the one that I really like uses deny by default. Perimeter security, deny by default. So deny by default means that all of the stuff that comes through that perimeter security device, you know, put that here so it's easier to see. That perimeter security device, everything that comes through has to be accepted. Um, it has to be accepted by essentially whitelisted by somebody in order to make it, in order to go through. And so it's, everything else is denied. The people who do this the best are, some, are people called the, who use a product called the ICS Defender. They use something called DPI, Deep Packet Inspection. They look at these packets down to the Ethernet IP level, to the Profinet level, and look and said, is this a operation that we accept. For example, if the quality PC is always reading three tags from the PLC, well, if the, all of a sudden the quality system gets compromised and it wants to write the, the machine speed now, DPI looks at that and goes, hey, that's not what you normally do. That's not what's whitelisted. So they say, nope, you can't, that message can't go through. So that's perimeter security de deny by default. The point here is you have to figure out how you're going to protect the control system when you deploy your device, whether it's an IT device that needs data from the factory floor or it's a device in the control system. Security is a prime thing that you need to think about. All right, so what else we need to, we need to talk about? Well, what about, you have to think about uh, operating systems generally in order to so if you're going to be a control system you know part of this you have to figure out if you're part of the manufacturing floor what kind of RTOS you have well Linux is very popular we started about seven eight years ago we started to see lots more people doing Linux Windows is always around for people who have a lot a lot of power in their systems we also see a lot of people that are using open open RTOS and that's very supportable. So we can support a number of the mainline operating systems. When it gets to some other, some other weird stuff, then it's a little bit harder to do. But these guys make it easy to actually deploy and get, connect, get your connectivity to the manufacturing system or the, uh, or the enterprise. Uh, now, another thing that, needs to be th that, that you need to think about when you're doing this is if you're going to send data to the fact to the enterprise data modeling becomes really really important data modeling says how are you going to package your data up so that it's easily recognizable by other applications in the world you don't want to have to work with each individual provider of applications say well here's the format for our data here's our spec you have to implement to our spec no, you want to provide this in an industry standard way and say, hey, we support this industry standard. Here it is. The only industry standard I know that I would and I encourage people to support today, might change later, is OPC UA with the part five data model. If you have a part five data, if you support OPC UA with the part five data model, then 
then you're going to be good and lots of applications will be able to talk to you and be able to get your data. If you don't know what OPC UA Part 5 is, you might want to get one of my books. You might want to call us and talk to us about how you can get connected in this industry standard way. Uh, right now, there's an organization you might want to look at if you're interested in data modeling. You might want to look at Sesame, sesame.org. Sesame is trying to make this actually a, a, a standard and have a store essentially where you can for free download these, uh, these part five specifications, part five data models so that you can, so the applications can easily use them and uh, get connected in a very easy way. Uh, so, you know, you know but the other thing, the only one more comment I'll make is you want to think about heart, when you think about your hardware, there's one thing I would say when you're the other, about hardware is no USB. Uh, USB is an easy way to get corrupt, to corrupt the factory floor, to get microprocessors corrupted. You don't want to support USB. It just makes your product look like, eh, somebody's going to put a USB stick in there and, and, and take over the device. So I would, I would not support USB at all. You also have to think about how are you going to make sure that the product that arrives at your end user is the same product, same code that you shipped. Because sometimes it'll go to a, sit at the distributor for a while, it'll go to a machine builder who's building machine up, it's gonna be on their floor for the next for three, four months while they build the machine. Then it goes to a test facility, it's sitting there for a couple of months. Then it finally comes to an, the manufacturer's facility and now has somebody been in there to, to corrupt the code in all that time and all those hands that have been around your product. So you need to think about how do you make sure that you have the same, that you know that you have the same code when it gets to the end user that it was when you shipped. So I'm John Rinaldi. I enjoy doing these videos. If you need to, talk, if you need to do so, uh, product line connectivity, if you're looking for a strategy, be glad to talk to you, have a conversation. We have these about once or twice a week with different people about how to do all this connectivity, how to do manufacturing, ma factory floor connectivity for control systems, how to do I IoT systems so that you can connect to the factory floor, how to protect and do security as you do that. We have a lot of expertise in, the, in this area. We'd love to talk to you. Give us a call. Thanks very much. I'll see you in my next video.